he wants to jump. 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Too many car. car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. You can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Me, me. Yeah. Only the man's coolant. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Hello, Brad, and other Brad. I was going to say, are you talking to me or are you talking to Brad? Yes. Returning guest, Bradley Brunell is here. I, I would say Bradley Brunell is our most prolific of guests. I was going to say, I think this is my fifth or sixth time on the show. So thanks for... I think it's your fifth time that everybody will have heard. Oh, and right. Sixth time, if you count the mystery 300th, 200th, 200. Oh, yeah. 200, yeah. Lost to the annals anal- of time. <laughs> Yeah, we're uh, we're actually over because we stopped saying them. We're over three. This might be three twelve. I wow. think this is nine thousand. <laughs> you have one thousand episodes, sir. <laughs> sir, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think if we got to a thousand episodes, I, I might we might stop. Just quit. That's it. We're done. <laughs> at a thousand? Because honestly, that's why pretty quit? impressive. Why quit at a thousand? I mean, how I many know. episodes? How many episodes did Seinfeld do? Not a thousand. Uh, not a thousand. <laughs> no, I know. Also, I think not. I think, not a good comparison. I think maybe like car talks over a thousand. Well, anything that's daily is going to be up there pretty quickly. Like any, you know, any kind of radio, sh- like traditional radio show or television yeah. show that's a daily thing is going to be, you know. But they are also staffed with writers, so that would still be like four years of daily sure so that's that's but think of think of somebody like i don't know like you know uh david letterman he probably did you know what 15 20 years so he yeah. must have done five six thousand episodes so sure it's crazy but again you know shows like that obviously we're, we're, we're talking about a totally different situation here we're talking about people who have talent and also are writers versus <laughs> yeah. A couple, and, a couple of in, car enthusiast hacks just sitting behind a computer talking to their friends. Hey, it's got you this but far. Hey, if our friends want to listen to 311 episodes, so be it. We'll keep making them. Who's going to stop All them? Matters. Nobody's going to stop them. In fact, we keep making more friends by doing it, so it's just going to keep growing. Yeah. yeah. Bradley, think... you're one of those. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of car talk, I think that that's one of the reasons why I like the third Cars movie that I watched with my kid because it's like the I think it's one of the last times like the Tappet brothers are together. Uh, I did not not realize they were even in it. They're in it for like a few scenes, like they hand it off, which is probably because mm-hmm. that when that movie was made, I don't know, fifteen or sixteen or something, twenty fifteen, sixteen, they were pretty old. And yeah, are they both gone now? No, no. One is. no one of the brothers passed like yeah. probably three or four years ago. So anyway, here we are. What's going on? Oh, yeah. We're right recording, aren't we? We are. <laughs> oh, uh, lots is going on, guys. Lots is going on. We wanted to have Bradley on because Bradley also wanted to come on because he wanted to talk about some stuff. So yeah, I mean, I like talking with you guys, but I do have things to to talk about. Right. Um, for one, which I've been on since I've been the director of the museum, but just barely. I've been at the museum now, the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum, just over a year. And uh, 
it's been a lot of fun. So come by, and if you're listening to this podcast, I'll give you a tour. Anybody wow. who's cool enough to listen to this show gets a free tour. Wow. Um, By cool, you mean pretty pedantic cool. and nerdy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into it. So if you ever find yourself in Cleveland, Ohio, drop me a line. Uh, I'll give you a tour of the museum. My tours are usually two hours, so uh, brick out some time. some time. You'll learn something. Yeah. I guarantee it. Um, and then the other thing is I have uh, signed on as kind of like brand director, I guess, of uh, Stripe Design. So one of my friends out west started a sock company, an enthusiast sock company. And um, a market that nobody knew needed to exist. Giving them socks. You know what? (laughs) There's an it's it's making money. There's enough of them out there that uh, there's demand. I mean, listen, I'm into it. I'm into it. It's 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 thinking outside the box that works usually. Right. Yeah. And that's certainly something thinking outside the box. And I didn't realize like what a market there was for socks. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody wears them. Right. And some people are way into it. You got a whole drawer full of them. I do. And they're so, all white or black. So right. <laughs> I need a little well, we variety. Need to fix that because I've got yeah. some really cool designs. Um, I, I, I'm one of those people that for years and years and years, you know, I never even thought about socks and they were always sure. just white or black. And sure. I actually think, Andrew, it was for your wedding where you forced everybody to buy funny socks or like different socks. I did. Um, I also did. I bought, I bought these socks that had. Uh, little slices of pizza and little bottles of sriracha on them, and nice. ever since then, I have added some some non black and white socks to my my repertoire, and I still have yes. that pair of Andrew's wedding socks that uh, I still wear. And every time I do, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, socks can be fun. So, so our current lineup is it's all motorsport and uh, based. So we've got. You know, some stuff from like um, Trans Am, Can Am, the 60s and 70s. We've got an Alitalia design like the um, Stratos. Yeah. We've got BMW M stripes. We've got Martini stripes. We have some of Golf, of course. Those are the, the iconic ones. And then uh, we'll have a drop coming soon. And that's what you do in the business. You call it a drop. Right. Um, where uh, we're. That's right. It's streetwear. So we've got um, a return of a couple old designs. So we've got Porsche Pasha, um, which goes right along with that 944 you got. Yeah, I may have to drive that barefoot from now on just in my socks. <laughs> and then we've got BMW M Rain, which is the fabric that was in like E36 M3s. The cloth. Um, ones, yep. Which is really cool. And then... Um, We've got a couple of other things. And then the big one is we did five different colors of the original IROC. Um, So in 1972, 73, there was the IROC single make series for uh, Porsche um, 73 RSs. Or, well, they were RSRs, so they were the race version of the RS. And uh, racing drivers from basically every series that was important to the U.S., Plus a little bit for Formula One. Uh, they came over, so there was NASCAR drivers and, and sports car drivers and F1 drivers, and they all came together for this one weekend where they all raced the same car to see who was the best racer. And, of course, it was at Riverside, so uh, uh, Mark Donahue just, like, walked over everybody else because he knew Riverside like the back of his hand. Lives so. there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, we did five different designs of, uh, they were like vividly colored Porsches and they've got like, it says stripe design in like the Porsche font and stuff like that. So it's very nerdy, but it's also like, if people don't know what it is, it's just a colored sock. Sure. So, you know, you can still wear it to the office and it doesn't look out of place. Um, but if they do know what it is, then it's kind of like, it's the, for the ones who do know the cognizant wink, 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 nudge, nudge. Exactly. You're cool. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's why socks have become popular, honestly, because, you know, you have to be somewhat conservative in most, you know, business settings. Sure. And that's the one place where you can kind of, yep. you know, cut loose a little bit because they're socks. 
Yeah, it's hidden under your pant leg. It's hidden under your shoe. They peek out every once in a while when you cross your legs or whatever. And sure. people go, oh, hey, nice socks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of those things that you have to like forcibly show to people for them to see it. And then the other big thing that we did was and- um, we're about to launch uh, Driving Glove. So we'll have a really cool driving glove that is okay. actually that checks really out. nice. That checks out. Have you... Are you like taking the back driving glove? They are um, like a, it's almost like a cycling glove. Like it's a mesh back design. Okay. Um, and they're vegan leather palm. So they're, they don't actually use any real leather. Um, but More importantly I, for me, are they, are they gluten free leather? Yeah. Right. Uh, I've been using them for a while and I'm not usually a glove guy, but I actually really like them. And I kind of have to wear gloves in the 912 because it's got a wood wheel. And if you get, you know, sweaty hands or whatever, the wood doesn't really grip. So it helps. Gives you splinters. Yeah, right. (laughs) Well, it's 912. It's got patina. So (laughs) patina on the steering wheel is splinters. That's right. Uh, It's funny. We were just discussing gloves here, too, because at the end of a work day, when I get in my car uh, here in the phoenix sun is going to kill you range in your porsche oh, yeah. and you put in your uh, driving gloves well i don't drive the porsche to work very often <laughs> but uh, when i do it has that momo wheel with the aluminum spokes and it uh-huh. has the shift pattern in the aluminum like plate on top of the the shift knob and both of those things will actually burn me yeah i hold on to them <laughs> so uh, i have a solution for that there's a company coming out with a Pasha branded sock you can put over that shifter. <laughs> right. And this is what I'm thinking. I'm going to need a whole bunch of Pasha. If I buy enough Pasha socks, can I reupholster my seat? Yes. All right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I like this. Uh, I could probably even get you the fabric just in big sheets. You know, <laughs> now that you're saying that, that would probably be a pretty long wearing seat material. Probably, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's stripe design with two eyes. Like it's a, like it's a, a rally stripe. So there's the eyes are like the stripe in the middle of the word. Sure. It's a, it's a thing anyway. Yeah, no. And I know that it's a, um, they make, you make bicycling socks too, right? Or you did. Yeah. So we have two different, uh, the, they're our designer, the, my friend who lives in California, who started this brand. Um, came from the world of cycling. So he knows a lot about that. And so the socks that we have are very, um, like, technically minded. So they they are typically used for cycling, but they can be used for a lot of things. And they have, like, a um, very breathable pattern, and they're kind of intentionally a little tight in the calf because it promotes blood flow. And uh, keeps your feet from falling asleep on long rides and stuff. So, um, yeah, I was I was unaware of the the cycling sock thing, obviously, until I met Naomi, who's a yeah. you know big, big, big time uh, road cyclist. And right. most of the like organized rides and things she does, you know, they usually have a commemorative sock. That's one of their things, and they're these specific kind of socks. And mm-hmm. I know that Stripe Design did the Radwood socks. And yes. I she was super excited and we were, you know, helping you guys out with the Radwood shows because, you know, she was able to get some of those stripe design Radwood socks and yeah. uh, she loves them when she's riding her bicycle because they're very, they're very good bicycle socks too. So and the, the new line was... that we just did is actually a different, it's more of a comfort based sock okay. um, than it is. So we, we've split our line into two. So we have Stripe Technica or ST. And then we have Stripe Comfort, which is SC. So, Aha. Um, yeah. So there will be more on the that. <laughs> yeah. It'll ha- there will be more on that on the on the website soon um, when we have that quote unquote drop. Um, so are you guys taking design suggestions? Sure. All right. We need uh, first gen Mitsubishi Eclipse rainbow dot cloth pattern. Okay. Yeah. For the, a very, for the 10 very specific, who... <laughs> it's a very specific yeah. market, but we need those. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you can, uh, next time you're in the Northeast, you can just take a look at Andrew's Eagle Talon. 
if you can, uh, if you can help me scrounge dots. up like 300 pre-orders we'll we'll get right on that i mean i'll keep playing the lottery and i'll buy all 300 myself. okay all right um, uh, honestly i bet there's enough people if it was there probably right, the right community you probably yeah, get probably 300 is. people that would buy those for at least 150 I, people to commit to two pairs. Maybe Rally Art Stripes or yeah. oh, Mackinac Paint Screen. Oh, Mackinac. we do have a new one that is the Toyota Stripe as well. So I'm sure. Okay, that's going to be common. Push that to the Overlander crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was something else that I was going to say. What was it? I don't remember. HTS. Oh, right. We have a, such a technical spread um, in our design repertoire, we actually did um, a line of socks for a company called Fast House. They do sure. um, off-road dirt bike stuff, dirt bike stuff exactly. Yep. So we helped design um, a, a sock that's specifically for motocross, and it goes under your knee brace so that it prevents rash under your knee brace. That's cool. That's cool. And so Fast it's House. Like, Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, uh, I it's like four different types of material. So there's um, like a traditional sock bottom, and then it goes into like an elastic uh, upper that goes all the way up to your thigh. And then there's like a rubber band around the inside, so it keeps it from falling down. And uh, yeah, they're they're really cool, and they're really like we talked to riders about what they were looking for and that kind of thing. So if you uh, can think of any like weird technical sock that would work really well in an industry that we aren't thinking of. I'm all ears. <laughs> no, that's cool. And uh, the fast house brand is like super fast growing right now. So it's cool. Yes. That you guys are, it's cool. That you guys are in touch with those guys. Um, yeah. They have a really neat aesthetic. Actually. I like a lot of their stuff. I do too. Um, we'll, we'll roll into that conversation a little bit later in the show, but I actually almost purchased a, a hat from them the other day just because I was in a place that sold their their stuff, and uh, right, I gener I, I genuinely like most of their stuff. It's very, it's it's like you can tell what it is, but it's also like not. This is a dirt bike brand. Like some of sure. their slogans and stuff can be like just motorsports related in general. Yeah, and it's kind of like a combination of like NASCAR's track house mm -hmm. along with who's that big one in LA race services kind of designs, yep. and it's yep. a lot of that similar like very bold, blocky, you know. A lot of cool designs, a lot of cool phrases and slogans, and I really dig that in a lot of these new motorsports brands. Um, sometimes I wish these brands did more than just clothing, but hey, mm -hmm. it's it's cool that there's these companies supporting motorsports-minded people in general, and with specific items like socks and gloves and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. HKS Oil Slick, that's one too. That's a good one. You probably saw. Oh that. yeah, for sure. I actually, I'm, I have a watch band of that that I wear every day, so. Hmm. that's one of my favorites. I would definitely wear HKS oil slick socks. Well, I know you've been doing this for a little bit of time um, and I haven't bought any socks from you, but I'll fix that. So. <laughs> well, it took a while for us to get them in. Uh, all of our socks were made in Italy. So okay. um, they were stuck in customs for like a month. So they, they just arrived at my house last week and I've got cases and cases of them. So uh well, yeah. you're not involved with Radwood anymore, so you might as well get involved with something right. else that has tons of cardboard boxes involved at your house. Right, right. So, yep. So, uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a big inventory uh, compiling system here in my office, and uh, boxes of socks. So we're still waiting for the uh, the uh, driving gloves to come in, but I got a sample, and they are rad. I'm not a, like I said, I'm not a driving glove guy, but they're they're good. So. I've never been a driving glove guy either, um, but I know a lot of people now, especially with the uh, kind of explosion of the popularity of suede steering wheels. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys, like uh, some factory cars now come with suede steering wheels, like some of the what's the, the Camaro and Corvette, I think, can, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of guys are wearing gloves when driving those because the oils in your hands yeah. aren't really good for the synthetic. They're not really suede. They're you know, whatever. Alcantara, uh, Alcantara, or whatever the newest version of that is. Um, I know they mat down really bad with the oils in your hands and stuff. And a lot of guys wear gloves when they when they drive those. So yeah. there's definitely a market that's growing for that. Or guys are doing all guys are doing track days will wear it because of sweat and and whatnot. But 
I think I want some because I want to uh, be able to hold my steering wheel and shift knob when I drive home from work. So, and I will say uh, they work very well for sim racing. I use mine okay. when I rally. Um, That's another place where hand sweat builds up a lot. So, uh huh. I definitely sweat more in sim than I do on the street because on the street I can roll the window down. And on the street, you have you know, air conditioning vents blow right in your hands. Right. And also, in sim racing, you're continuously at 10 tenths. Yes. So it's yeah. intense. Yeah. So, like 11 tenths. You drive so hard in sim racing because you can't die. That's right. So, yeah. Sometimes I overdrive in sim racing. Because... That's what I mean. You're at 11 or 12 tenths <laughs> because you're overdriving the car. Yeah. And sweating profusely the whole time. So, yep. no, that's cool. I'm, I'm super stoked for you. Um I know that you guys are putting a lot of work into this and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see it, see it grow. I know that's had some ebbs and flows. It's been around for a few years. Um, and as somebody who I don't actually own any striped socks, but my significant other does and uh, she's a big fan and they've held up very well. So happy user here. So cool. We're regular listeners will know that we're not a big um, proponent here of uh pushing products, but when it's something from one of our very good friends and a product we actually like, come on in and discuss it with us. So yeah, so that's quality stuff. Uh, you know, when, when the opportunity came up um, to jump on board with Stripe, it was like, you know, uh, I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't something I didn't believe. It wasn't something I believed in. So, right. Yeah. Right. Which is like basically what I'm saying. Like we don't promote things we don't believe in. Like we've only ever had one kind of pseudo sponsor ever, and sure, because it was a product that we liked. So that's uh, that's where we're at. So it's not BS. We actually actually do enjoy these, and I will be purchasing some striped socks from you as well. Because again, thanks to Andrew getting married a few years back, I uh, have expanded my my sock repertoire <laughs> a little bit to some extra colors and. I have some special ones I wear on different holidays now, and I'll have to get some some more fancy stuff, especially because I'm going back to a quote unquote office job very soon. So, yeah, yeah, you know, I can officially talk about that today too, Andrew. By the way, that's all above board now and happening. <laughs> so, anyway, well, welcome, Brad. Thanks for chatting about your socks. Yeah, um, you guys kicking me off now? Is that it? No, no, no. You're, yeah, you're here. Five for the, minutes. Now you get talk, you can talk about anything. Five minutes, man. Wait, twenty-one minutes and forty-seven <laughs> seconds. You're talking about socks. You uh, can sit there on the couch if you want. Hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you can hang out and watch now. Um, this reference earlier in the in the show when Andrew said giving them socks is actually a funny little anecdote that I'm going to bring up. There used to be a commercial, probably in what, like 05, 04? Yeah. 06 ish. And it was yeah. Charles Barkley, who yep. is one of my all time favorite basketball players. Uh, in fact, growing up in the Boston area, obviously, and being a basketball fan, I was a Celtics fan. But my second favorite team was the Phoenix Suns. Uh, and it was solely because of Charles Barkley, because he was a character. And then he did a commercial probably for T-Mobile or Sprint or one of the major carriers in like 2004, 2005, where he was talking to another player. And I forget who it was. It was like a rookie player. And he would do like run errands for him. And one of the things he called him to get was socks. And at one point in the commercial, he like bolts up in bed on his cell phone. He's like, whatever, man, just give me them socks. And (laughs) a good friend of ours... Uh, because I, I used to laugh at that commercial way more than I should have every time it came on, just being a giant fan of, of the man. That uh, for Christmas one year, a friend of mine took the still uh, still image of Charles Barkley and just put like, a cartoon bubble above it that just said, give me them socks and gave that to you for Christmas. Uh, and I wore that shirt so much that I can't wear it anymore. So <laughs> that's kind of where that came from. So maybe you should use that for your advertising. I'm sure... There's no kind of uh, uh, no kind of copyright on that, so you're fine. Just a picture yeah. of Charles Barkley saying, "Give me them socks," and then yeah. wearing some. Nobody get mad at you. His management wouldn't care. I promise. No, probably not. No, totally fine. 
using the likeness yeah. of a celebrity without permission. I see yeah. it on Facebook all the time. It's fine. This is fair use. It's, yeah, it's totally fair use. <laughs> you you have to take the picture. That's all. Yeah. Right. So I took and a picture like, of the picture. Yes. Oh. It's perfect. And then unlike the Facebook stuff, I always see where they they use celebrities and they put fake quotes over them. This is a real quote because that commercial existed, so you can't even deny it. So you're fine. <laughs> so more copyright free ideas from Brad. Yes. Uh, anyway, that's that's the that is the definitely answer. listen to Brad and not a copyright lawyer. Listen, who says I'm not a copyright <laughs> lawyer? Nobody knows that. <laughs> Nobody knows what my my schooling is. That's right. Um, my schooling is unfortunately automotive. It's not copyright law. So uh, I am actually starting a new job in a month, a month from tomorrow. So congratulations. I, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited, actually. I wound up, I'm not even sure if I even ever talked about it here. Andrew, remember if I ever talked about it here that I'm working in a body shop right now? I probably did. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, I'm working in a body shop right now. And it was kind of a, a stopgap kind of thing in between some things. Um, but I managed to land a job at an insurance company being a field appraiser again, which is, which was the goal. So I'll have, uh, I'm excited. Basically it's a major national carrier that has good benefits and good time off and is, uh, seems to be appreciative of my experience and time and is going to, uh, hopefully take care of me better than I'm being taken care of right now. So Andrew, you'll be excited to know that we won't have to record so late because I'll be working, you know, kind of a hybrid from home on the road kind of deal. So I'll be able to be here right at five o'clock Pacific time. And finally, uh, you're putting this podcast ahead of everything else in your life. <laughs> yes, this is the whole reason that I'm doing it. But current problem is I don't get home till like 630, sometimes seven Pacific in the summertime anyway. And that's that means that it's 10 o'clock your time. So it's pretty late for you guys. So yep. I do apologize, but tomorrow's Friday. So you shouldn't be working hard anyway. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm taking tomorrow off, but um, I do have Valley vibes at seven o'clock in the morning. So this is I'll true. be a little, a little tired, but that's okay. This is true. It's worth it. Actually, Bradley, that's something else I'd like to talk to you about right now. What is Valley vibes? Where did this come from? Um, Valley Vibe. So, uh, I moved to Cleveland like a year and a half ago and I was talking to a friend of the show, Myron Vernis, and we kind of had this of lost episodes, <laughs> this mutual, uh, desire for a little bit of the, um, relaxed West coast style of car meet where it's like everybody's welcome there's no like you know it's got to be you know one make only or it's got to be whatever it's like no we're just car guys looking to hang out um and we've got a national park right here uh literally 30 minutes from my house and i live like basically downtown cleveland so I hop on the highway, I'm down there in the park in half an hour. I bring coffee, Myron brings donuts, and we have like 20, 30 cars show up on a Friday morning um, at 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. So like the people who have to work at 9 can still come and hang out for an hour. Um, and the people who don't have to work can stick around till 10 or they can come a little later. Um, and it's so far, it's been really cool. It's just kind of a, we're not really like promoting it. We just share it to our friends on social media and they invite their friends and, uh, it's kind of caught on a little bit, but we also don't want it to like explode because we don't want to, you know, overstay our welcome in the national park. So, yeah, because national uh, parks and cars don't always mix. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're lucky in that um, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park is not the kind of national park you have to like pay to get in. It's, it's just an Ohio National Park. Yeah, it's it's just part of the city. Like it's literally the Cleveland Akron 
metro area is all around the park. It's like right in the middle of everything. So Would you call it Ohio's Central Park. Sure. All right. <laughs> um, I I really like it down there. Apparently, it was an absolute hole like 20 years ago. Like uh, people use it almost like a dumping ground. And they invested a lot in it and revived the place. And it's, it's really nice. There's like great hiking and lots of great bike trails. And um, it's, it's really cool. So we started at a uh, like 1930s era service station that's still there, um, which was in, it was there before the park was a park. So it kind of got grandfathered in. And then once the national park bought the land that it's on, they turned it into an art gallery, but it still looks like a service station. Like they restored it to look like a service station. So we started there, uh, with Valley vibes, like, uh, almost a year ago now. And um, it quickly grew too big for the little lot uh, with the service pumps out front. So we uh, <laughs> we were politely told, or not so politely told, by the uh, highway patrol that we were not allowed to be there <laughs> with quite so many cars. So right. we found a, a nearby parking lot that would hold us all. And uh, so, yeah, we meet there now. Yeah, I, I try to get these little, you know, Ohio digs in there. And I apologize because I have visited now a couple times. And actually, it's quite lovely. Um, yeah. I, I The internet would make me think that Ohio was a, a trash pit and a terrible place to be. But um, every time I've gone, it's been great. And uh, ironically enough, uh, I had breakfast at the same place now twice by accident there. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, that, whole right. area was, that whole area was a, a beautiful little spot. And I, uh, I I really dig it. And I can see why you live there. Other than winter, I could see. Yeah, you know, why I love it here. nine months of the year. Sure, this... <laughs> sure, and, and I'm honestly surprised by the car culture there because, you know, again, if you just listen to the internet, um, Ohio car culture is, you know, supercharged mid '90s Pontiacs and yep. late '60s muscle cars, and everything else yep. is trash and must die. Yeah. But what the actuality is, is that that's very different. And while there is that mindset with some people, I'm sure, uh, I've been continuously surprised by what I see there. And uh, yeah, it seems I mean, like pretty, a pretty neat place for a decent, a decent place to live. It's not, you know, coastal or sure, not wintry. Sure. I mean, I, I uh, you know, maybe look at this from a different perspective because I see all these collections in the area as you know, director of a museum, um, I get to reach out to all of these people, but like motorcycle culture is huge. I know Bugatti collectors. I know, um, maybe one of the most impressive car collections I've ever seen is, you know, 30 minutes from my house. Um, there's, I mean, just so many, Great collections. And the big thing that is weird, and maybe it's a Midwest thing, but like a lot of these big collections are totally unknown because they don't show off. They like don't take these cars out and go, hey, come look at my great cars. They just have them to appreciate them and they drive them one by one and like don't really flaunt it. So, yeah. Andrew and I talk about that often, Andrew, right? About the whole like, and Ohio is That's sort of Midwest, but also like it's also sort of Northeast and it's probably a little bit of spill over there that like, especially in New England's the same way where it's, you know, what do you say, Andrew, that they, they don't, I forget how you phrase it usually, but I don't know. It's like Yankee conservatism. They're just like, yeah, don't. it's like sure. we have this stuff, but They're wealthy, but we don't show it off. You. Yeah. Yeah. This is for me, not for you. But if you do happen to see it, I'm glad you enjoy it. But it's, I don't it's not like in California where it's like, look at me. Right. Lambo. Right. Right. Or here in Phoenix where people will literally, you know, hire people to drive their other car to the show so they can all of their stuff can show up at the same time. Um, which I'd like to do sometimes too, but <laughs> it's not to show off. It's just, you know, they're talking about 
Radwood Phoenix this year. And uh, I was talking to our you know, good friend of the show and friend of ours, Ron, and a couple other people. And it's like, we could like, between like four of us, we would have like 50 cars there. So we should get all our <laughs> stuff there. <laughs> we should work some kind of deal to get them in there without paying for each one individually. But we shouldn't have a uh, Ro- Radwood royalty section. We should have a uh, Radwood four people section. Yeah. So, but anyway, no, it's, it's, that's a very similar thing in New England, I think. Um, so, yeah, I get it. I get it. But it the, nice the great sometimes. thing about, I mean, Valley Vibes, the great thing about Valley Vibes is that the variety is always there. Like every week, it's different stuff because not everybody can come every week. Um, Myron and I do because we don't have any, we don't have a life. Like sure. <laughs> all we do is car stuff. So we come down every week, but like the cast of characters changes every week. And there's maybe one or two that'll come more frequently than the others, but it's always different. It's always, and, and by virtue of knowing a bunch of people who are free on a Friday, most of them have more than one car. So sure. like they'll bring something different every week. I've been known to do that. I did, I went like seven weeks in a row without bringing the same car twice. Nice. So. <laughs> so uh yeah it's a really cool little vibe and uh my inspiration largely came from um the the good uh good vibes breakfast club yep yeah i think the yeah. the pictures of the good vibes club really pushed us in a lot of people and um yeah. you know i know that andrew has been doing the uh four noon cup there in new england yep. Uh, and, we did uh, one. I, I hey, need to do another it's, one. It's a start. I have not still not done one here, um, and I've been talking about doing something that the, the Four Noon Cup West out here with our friend Chris and uh, Chris and I actually did our own little. Uh, we had our own private cars and coffee a couple weeks ago, um, where it was uh, invite only, just him and I. We didn't invite anybody else, and we were just talking about how that's the kind of vibe we want, but with like maybe five or six more people. And then yeah. eventually, obviously, everything grows that's what to we what did. you guys have there. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. So cool. I dig it. And I really want to have something like that here, too, just because even the best shows eventually seem to get shows the wrong word. The best gatherings eventually seem to attract the wrong people. So you got to really try to keep things subtle. And I think a Friday is great. That's that right there is you have two things going for you. 7 a.m. start keeps a lot of idiots out. And yep. availability on a Friday yep. kind of changes the clientele you're going to get. So, totally. And the combination of both not having to work on Friday and being up at 7 a.m. means you only get a very certain group of people that are going to come there. And Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, every time that I post about it on Facebook or whatever, I get somebody that's like, are you sure this isn't supposed to be 7 p.m.? I'm like, no, it's yeah. definitely 7 a.m. And they're like, no, there's no way I can make that. It's like, yeah, okay, well, that's not for you. And we're not trying to be there's, exclusive here. It's just that this is just what we're doing. And there's a thousand shows for people who want to go to a show on Saturday. Yeah. It's, it's, you don't it's kind of like, a, you could throw a dart and find one. Yeah. It's, it's like gatekeeping without officially gatekeeping. Yep. I like it. Yep. This is good. Unfortunately, I could not pull off a Friday morning show. So <laughs> I'm not going to start one here. I mean, when I had a job that had good parking, I would, Sometimes in the summertime, take one of my old cars on a Friday. Sure. So like that would totally make sense. I would, I could easily go at seven in the morning and then still make it in time to go to work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I and haven't had a job where I don't do start that. at seven thirty for a while, so I have to fix that first. <laughs> but no, it's it's a it's a cool idea, and every time I see pictures of it, and you guys ran all year, right? You didn't even stop in the winter. Uh, yeah. No, we we change it from. When the snow flies, we change it to breakfast. So we'll we'll meet at a diner so that we can be inside where there's heat. Okay. But, um, yeah. So from like middle of October to like March, <laughs> we're yep. we're meeting at a diner and having breakfast, and then you know April to October is in the park. No matter what, rain or shine, you know, cold or hot. And that's a similar thought to what Chris and I were talking about out here. So doing, you know, places that are mostly outdoor patio seating during the not so boiling months. And then for, you know, 
July and August having places that have meet somewhere that has a nice indoor seating area. So, uh, and our thing was we were going to do, or we're still, we're still going to do it, but a different, a different, a different spot each month. So that sometimes it might be close to yeah. your house and sometimes it might be a longer drive for you. So sure. show up when you can. Yeah. So similar, similar theories, but we're all trying to do something like that. Just trying to curate our own kind of slice of car culture. And that's uh, one of the neat things about car culture because there is space for everything, right? Yeah. So. Oh, Andrew. Yes. Any project car stuff? We should move into project cars real fast. Um, I don't have anything. So if you do, go for it. Bradley, any project car stuff you want to inform <laughs> us about? Uh, I put aero discs on my 996. I talked about your 996 a few episodes ago ad nauseum because I was in love yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, it's a really cool car. It's a it's a it, very cool car. But thankfully, my absence from it has made me less needy to myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, it has made, there's no you, negative, not negative. It's still a great car. Yeah. So I will tell you the, the wheel bearing got louder. Uh, okay. So I ordered a wheel bearing it. for it. I need to replace that. And then um, on my most recent trip, I went to a Concours in uh, South Bend, Indiana. It's like a four-hour drive there and uh, four hours back. Uh, the power steering pump started to whine. So, um, yeah. it's car uh, just mad at you for taking an eight-hour round trip yep. without having to replace the wheel bearing first. Yep, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I've got a I've got a little bit of deferred maintenance to do, and I bought some tail lights for it because it needs those, and that was ungodly expensive. And uh, uh, yeah, I need to do motor mounts. Um, so yeah, it'll be basically a brand new car. I'm do an oil change. I'll probably do that this weekend. So let's talk uh, aero discs. Yeah, I love aero discs. Uh, As I think everything. all three of us do. Andrew will agree. Yeah. And I wanted to see if I could do it myself. And I had a few ideas of how to make it work. Um, my version one was going to be, I've got extended lug, lug studs. So I was basically going to stack washers on top of the lug nuts and then put the aero disc on and then put a nut on top of that. And in practice, it didn't work well enough. Huh. So then I was like, okay, I've got to cut the center out so that I can still bolt the wheel to the car with the aero disc installed. So then I cut a big hole so that I could, you know, still reach the lug nuts and then uh, attached the, the aero disc directly to the wheel. And uh, in version 1.1, which is where I am right now, it's held on with just, uh, I cut. I drilled holes in the aero disc and then ran zip ties to tie it to the wheel. And so right now I'm just using this for testing and I'm going to test uh, brake temperatures to make sure that it's not getting too hot. And I'm going to use brake dust to test whether or not the, the dust is going the right direction. So if it's going out the back of the wheel, uh, I don't know, that's probably not good. I wanted to extract out the front so that it's actually pulling air from the underside of the car. Okay. Um, and so then, what was the issue with bolting them to the extended studs? Because that seems to me to be the most reasonable uh, attachment. I, uh, I couldn't find a the, the hardware to make it happen ended up being a lot more expensive than I wanted it to be. Hmm. So... Uh, it would have been like another five hundred dollars in hardware to make it work for just a lug uh, bolt with uh, or a lug nut with some washers. Well, I mean, you don't really want a full height lug nut sticking up. You want like um, a flush mount so that it's flat, so it's not four lug nuts just above the right. aero disc. So I was looking at like, um sleeves and and bolts that might work like a, a low profile bolt 
Um, I was looking at a bunch of different ways to make it happen. And my, yeah, I guess you didn't have any, like you didn't have like a, a sunk in section of it. So they would have sat on top. I see what you're saying now. Right. Yes. So you would need to machine it with like a sunk in center, which obviously is a more complicated right. process. Okay. And I, I've, I've considered and looked into all this a few times in the past and never pulled the trigger because my car is never going to be ready that I want to put aerodics on. Uh-huh. Um, but I've always considered like how would how would you make this because the sets you can buy are all either very vintage and expensive or very modern and for 18 19 inch wheels and I'm looking for you know a 15 inch kind sure of so sure and the the custom ones in are probably far better than what I can do but they are pretty expensive it's like 1200 bucks for a set yeah, to get custom a lot of money made. for a dress up part, not an actual. Yeah, part. sure. So, so I, I yeah, do right it. now, right now I'm doing some testing and I think that, um, the next version, I will work on a better way to mount them to the wheel. And I'm thinking it'll be like a 3d printed, um, little loop that goes around the back of one of the spokes and will bolt directly to the face of the aero disc. So there'll be oh. like recessed hardware in the face. So it can be uh, bolted directly to this little bracket and that'll clamp it to the wheel. So it's we'll see. Like a, almost like it's clamping itself. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's neat. And if anybody wants to look at your Instagram account is plug in hybrid. Yes. Um, and there's definitely photographs of it there i i dig it i think they look cool um, yeah i'm excited to see where you go with them and and eventually there will be working out a pattern on there or something something to give it a little a little more visual gravitas sure. but for now it's just a test so yeah, tomorrow my, will be my, my first highway test with them on so we'll see if they don't go flying off at speed i'm sure they won't i was gonna say the the your attachment process makes me fear for p- pedestrians but hopefully that's not an issue so. <laughs> No, they're they're on there pretty solid. Maybe upgrade to some metals, some metal uh, yeah. ratcheting devices to hold them in place. Yes. Yeah. So especially because the heat cycling of a wheel, um, plastic doesn't love heat cycling. Fair point. So, yeah, that's just where my thought process goes. I, I think of the I think of the poor pedestrian, but <laughs> what do I know? Uh, very cool. So my project car updates. Um, I didn't do any car stuff last weekend because I was busy buying something again. <laughs> uh, I did allude to it last episode a little bit, um, but I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Uh, and it did not actually happen the way I thought it was going to happen. So I'm glad I didn't say anything last episode. But I've been for probably, well, pre-podcast days, um, probably about 10 or 11 years ago, I rode a motorcycle on a regular basis. Um, Andrew, when would you say I stopped that? Probably 2012-ish? I think so. Yeah. I have photographs of it in about that time period, so that would make sense. Um, But anyway, I stopped riding a motorcycle in about 2012, um, and it wasn't due to the lack of interest in riding a motorcycle. It was just due to what generally happened to things in my life at that point. Uh, as I'm sure you'll all remember, my car is always being broken. The 1980 motorcycle that I rode broke, and I never got around to fixing it. And through other forces that were in my life at the time, it just never became a priority, and it sat and sat and sat. And actually, I think I actually sold it to Andrew for a little bit of time, and then bought it back, and then it was sitting behind another friend's house for a long time, and it just got to the point where if I wanted to put that bike back together, it would, you know, take a lot of effort. Um, fast forward to maybe two to three years ago, I started getting really interested in the dual sport style of motorcycles. Like the, it's not a proper dual sport, but something that could take on like a fire road and also ride around down. And I was really interested in the Royal Enfield Himalayans. Um, because they're kind of perfect looking. They have that 70s, 80s kind of standard looking motorcycle, but they're a little bit 
taller suspension, a little bit taller fenders, knobbier tires, all kinds of like crash protection bars, very upright looking, very not dirt bike looking, but very early scrambler looking, I guess you'd say. Um, it's just a classic look. And I've wanted to pull a trigger for a while. They're super dirt cheap. Back in November, I was ready to buy one. And my local dealership, now this motorcycle lists for $5,500. They're dirt cheap. But my local dealership was like, all right, $5,500, perfect. Actually, I think, Andrew, you went to the dealership with me when you were here. Um, and the guy was like, yeah, it's like 8500 bucks out the door. And I was like, <laughs> that seems excessive for a $5,000 motorcycle. And then that particular salesman was like, well, if the markup bothers you that much, you should just look at this Ducati because the markup is the same, but you won't notice it as much because it's a more expensive bike. And I was like, that is the worst sales tactic I think I've ever heard. Because yeah, but, I didn't come here to buy a seventeen thousand dollar Ducati, but, I came here but to buy you a five thousand dollar Royal Enfield. Why are you even selling these things? So I got mad at that dealer. Never went back. Um, fast forward now to a little earlier this year. Uh, another friend of the show, Steve, his wife actually bought a different model Royal Enfield and got it for a much more reasonable price. So that started my gears turning again, and I was like, well. It would cost me less to buy this motorcycle back where he bought his and have it shipped home. Let me see what's close around here for me to buy one within a rideable distance. Um, so I called places in like San Diego and Los Angeles and Albuquerque and Las Vegas. And I got, you know, out the door pricing on a new Himalayan. The dealership in Las Vegas, believe it or not, was actually the best deal. And they were like, all told, out the door, we can have you in one for like 6800 bucks, including everything. And I was like, all right, that's a good price. Now, the issue with buying one in Las Vegas is it would be temp tagged, I'd get it home, and then I'd have to register it here. And because I bought it new, I have to pay sales tax. So when factoring in the sales tax, it's like another 500 bucks. So it'd be like 7,100 or so or something like that. Plus the trip to get it and bring it back or have it shipped. So it all added back up to almost the same price as the ones here. So I was like, all right, well, obviously I can't pull this off. So let me give the local dealer one more chance. Um, but I'm not going to talk to that salesman because I don't like him. I'll find somebody else. So because she's supportive of all my bad ideas, <laughs> uh, Naomi went with me and we went down to this, the local dealership, Andrew, that you and I went to before, uh, saw a different salesman, super nice guy. And he came with about the same numbers. It was closer to nine grand when he came back with. And I was like, all right, what? Well, yeah. I was like, well, what is the realistic number for one of these? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, I've been pricing them out. I said, I was actually here, you know, maybe six or seven months ago. And I left, I told him the whole story. And the guy's like, well, that was not a very nice like interaction you had. I was like, absolutely not. He's like, well, we work, who are you working with? And I was like, I don't remember his name. He's just some salesman. I was mad and I forgot about him. And I swore I'd never come here again. I'm only here again now because I've gotten realistic pricing from four other dealers, but it's going to take me a day trip to get there. I would like to buy this bike locally and not have to take a day trip to go get it. The local, the uh, not local dealer, and I, I was like, "Here's the, here's all the paperwork." He quoted me sixty seven hundred bucks, and the guy was like, "Okay, let me see what I can do." They Sharp only had a pencil. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they only had a silver one in stock, and I really wanted the rock red black two tone combination. So he came back, and he had a number that wasn't too far off. It was a little higher, but it included you know Phoenix sales tax, also registration plates included everything. Like I'd ride out the door. The only thing I'd be responsible for would be, you know, getting my insurance policy. And it was like 74 or $7,500. And I was hemming and hawing. And because I didn't want a silver one, I really wanted the red. And if I'm going to pay retail on a brand new one, I was like, I really want the red. So I didn't buy it that night. And I went home to think about it. And you know what happens when you go home to think about something, you start questioning everything and you give yourself time and you're like, 
I really shouldn't spend that much money on a motorcycle still. It's not that much money. I should. I easily could have. Not easily could have. I'm not trying to like be like, oh, I'm rich because I'm not. Because it's my bike and cheap motorcycle. But I easily could have made it work. Or I could have made it work. Anyway, so I spend the next day now doing more and more research. This is like a, I like it was a Friday. So I was not in the mood to work anyway. So I spent the whole day doing more and more research. And I noticed that our non rural Enfield dealer here in town showed a 2022 model in stock with only 2,100 miles on it. Brand new and I was like, that's a, as, as close to brand new as it gets. I mean, the bikes have a three year warranty on them. I, I should just look at that one. So it was 40, it was originally 49.99, which is 500 bucks off new. But I was like, well, it won't have all the setup fees and all that stuff, so I can probably get it less. Their markdown price was $44.99 on their site. So I went down to look at it. Uh, I walked in this dealership. They weren't super high pressure, so that was cool. Like I had to actually find a salesman, um, which I appreciate in a dealership. Take note, anybody listening, don't jump on people when they walk in the door. Let them meander <laughs> a little bit because they're more than likely to buy something if you let them meander a little bit. So I saw the bike I wanted. I went over, looked at it, kind of made sure it wasn't a rat or hadn't been dropped or anything crazy. Uh, and it hadn't. It was very clean. A clean title, supposedly, all that good stuff. Uh, it had a little sticker on it, you know, forty four ninety nine, which is a pretty good deal, I thought, for what ostensibly is a brand new motorcycle, right? That's $3,000 off or $4,000 off the price I was going to have to pay out the door somewhere else. So I finally look at it. I went and looked at some helmets and some gear to kind of decide because I haven't, again, ridden in 10 years. My stuff's all out of date. Um, kind of, you know, futzed around there, looked at some stuff, found a salesman. And it turns out he was a sales manager. And he's like, well, there are fees on top of that. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Same. He goes, all right, well, put me some numbers down. Same thing. They come back with a $9,000 price tag. What? Ugh. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm not even going to talk to you guys anymore because I'm not, I buy a brand new one for $3,500 less than this. Like, what are you doing? Like, I'm out. He's like, whoa, let's, let's, let's just talk about it first. And I was like, all right, well, we'll talk. He goes, what would what it take to get you? Rube? Like, come yeah. on. He's like, what would it take to get you out the door on this bike today? He's like, and now it's predatory. He, now the manager and the salesman have now said, this bike's been here for two months. It's not our typical clientele's motorcycle. We want it gone. And I was like, all right. I don't know if they made a mistake or if that's part of their game, but I'll go along with it. I said, if you can get me out the door with my helmet, my jacket, my gloves, the motorcycle, tax, title, licensed, or $5,500, I'll buy the bike. Whoa. Yeah. A hardball. <laughs> right. And they were like, let's see what we can do. I was like, okay. He goes, well, every used bike has to go through, you know, a used bike check. We have to pay our guys. He goes, on this bike here, we did $800 in recon. I was like, okay, fair. I'm fair. That's fine. He's like, we did buy it right. I was like, okay, fair. He goes, this is the GPS. I was like, I don't need that. It was like $700. He's like, this is the. The tire tire warranty it was like four fifty. I was like these tires are seventy five dollars. Like I don't need four hundred and fifty dollars for two year coverage on seventy five dollar tires. Like I'll take the risk. Um, and then there was a couple other like insurances and this that. I was like I don't need any of that. I just want the motorcycle, nothing else, just the motorcycle. So he goes all right. He's going back and forth, and he comes back, and he puts it down in front of me. Um, and he marked the bike down to thirty four hundred dollars. <laughs> um, and he put all the gear in, uh, and he's like, "I can do fifty six seventy five out the door." And we were like, "Sold." Put your hand out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at the haggle on you. So, I felt victorious. And again, I don't know if this is part of their scheme or whatever, but whatever, it worked for me. They sold me a motorcycle. I don't feel like I got taken. Um, I feel like it's a much better price. And now if I decided that I can ride this bike for a few months, if it's not for me, it'll be an easy sale because I'm not into it for $7,000, like a brand new one. Yeah. It's like I said, basically a brand new bike for $3,000 off, including my helmet, my jacket, and my gloves. Um, and I didn't get like a super cheap helmet. I bought a nice bell with the MIPS, uh, safety package in it. Um, 
it's a full face, not one of the retro ones that I was looking at, but probably a better helmet than those. And uh, I've ridden it already in 105 degree weather and it has enough ventilation that I didn't die. Um, and a nice riding jacket with all the, you know, padding in it and a nice set of gloves with the, you know, hard knuckles on them. So, it, you know, God forbid I do go down, I have the right crash protection. And uh, I'm totally stoked. I've done probably, I don't know, 70 miles or so, so far on the bike. Um, unfortunately, not a ton because it's, I bought it during a heat wave here. It's literally been 115 degrees, so it's not the best riding weather. Uh, but I have it and I can go out in the mornings and get back before it's super baking hot and uh, I'm I'm enjoying it so far. So yeah, I'm stoked. And the money I save now, I can buy the side bags and uh, carry on doing uh, Royal Enfield Himalayan stuff. So I not riding for 10 years. It took a little bit. Like I was a little, a little uneasy riding at home. Maybe uneasy is the wrong word, but like coming to like a stop sign, I was my, you know, the muscle memory wasn't there. You know, I had to like get back into the, this is how you do this smoothly. And this is how you come to an almost stop before you put your feet down. So you don't look like you're wobbling around like an idiot. But, cool. you know, after a few tries of that, life was good. Um, it's different riding here than in the Northeast because 99% of your turns are 90 degree turns. Uh, and I was never really good at tight turns. I have since become in that 70 miles an expert at really tight 90 degree turns. So that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm into it fairly inexpensively. Uh, it's, you know, you can't really beat an almost new motorcycle for 3,800 bucks plus some, plus some fees. Right. So I, I feel like that was a, uh, a haggling price win and uh i'm on a bike that i enjoy so and everybody so far that's seen it like most normies have never heard of royal enfield which is weird because it is the literally longest existing motorcycle manufacturer on the planet but not um, here <laughs> no but they have sold them here off and on since the beginning uh there was a time period from like i don't know the 70s through the 2000s where they didn't which is probably why people don't know it because that's the modern era. But I don't know what year they started selling them here again. Maybe early 2000s. Bradley, do you know? Um, they were sold here off and on for many, many years. The The interesting thing is that Royal Enfield started out as a British brand. Yep. They, yep. Ex they expanded into India. Then the British brand died, but they were so successful in India, they kept making them. Sure. So it was like, yeah, so now they're an Indian brand. Just like Jaguar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they have all this British history. They, they were a small arms manufacturer that got yep. into making motorized bicycles in 1901. Yep. And their, their, logo, their slogan is literally built like a bullet. And they've made a Royal Enfield model called the Royal Enfield Bullet since the beginning. And I remember when they first started selling bullets here again from the Indian built ones in like... Yeah. It must have been the early 2000s. I think they I were not good. Pretty, they were not good, but they were cool looking. Yeah, they've, they've and, invested a lot in quality of manufacturing in the last 15 years. Yep. And I yeah. was really, really impressed with their twin cylinder bikes, the, the 650s. The 650s? Yeah. Yeah, those are yeah, so no, good. I, I, like anything else in life I get into, I get into it too hard, and um back into motorcycling hard here. And I think that, uh, I think that if the right deal comes along, eventually I'll probably wind up with an INT 650. That's a good point. bike. It's a really good looking bike and it's a really yeah, good performing bike. And they're there. You can tell where they cut some corners, um, to keep the price down, but it's, I mean, 90% of the riding experience of a triumph for half the money. Yeah, less than half sometimes. Some of these, some of the yeah. triumphs, the similar style triumphs. Granted, they're twelve hundred CCs versus six fifty, but they're fifteen grand. Yeah. So it's a it's a big difference in in money, and you know, I, my riding skill doesn't need a twelve hundred. You know, a six fifty <laughs> sure. is plenty. You know, and and that's what I've said. You know, people with motorcycles in America, especially, it's always like, oh, you didn't buy the thousand? What are you a girl? Yeah. But it's not necessary. Like I've. 
I worked in a motorcycle store in the past and I used to ride a, a CBR 600 F4i, which is like a hundred horsepower motorcycle, right? And, mm-hmm. or maybe a little bit less, but it's high two figures at least. I don't remember the exact numbers. It's a fast sport bike still. It's a, it's a pretty quick sport bike. Um, and when I got rid of that, every bike I've had since then has been a sub 500 CC single cylinder motorcycle. And I have just as much fun cranking around town on a sub 500 cc single cylinder as I did on this weapon of a sport bike that I couldn't ride to its full potential anyway, because by the top of first year, yes, first year, (laughs) you're literally breaking every speed limit in town. So this thing here, it's the same ethos with driving a small, you know, sports car, uh, whether it be a Spitfire or a Miata or something, you're wringing its neck banging through the gears and you're just doing 40 miles an hour. And that's just, that's just what I prefer in a vehicle. I don't need something that's until I go drive Bradley's 700 horsepower, 996. (laughs) Then for a few weeks, I think I need that, but then I get back into my slow cars and I'm just, I'm just trundling along at 55, 60 miles an hour. And I'm totally happy. I also like my slow cars. So don't, no, I know you do. It's just, it's, for anybody who knows you, Brad, it's been years and years and years of anything more than 200 horsepower is a waste. And now <laughs> you literally own a car with three and a half times that. And it's, <laughs> it's the, the irony is not lost on me. So it just it kind of cracks me up a little bit. So what's the displacement on this bike? Uh, 411 cc's. Huh. All right. So it's, it's a small bore. It's very low horsepower. It's like 24 or 25 horsepower. Um, Huh. So it's literally not fast. Like I will lose a drag race to grandma's minivan. Um, but I'm okay with it because it's, I don't need anything more than that. And then if I was going to ride it across country, it might be a little slow for major interstates, but that's not the point of this bike. The point of this bike is to explore, right? And living here in the, you know, Phoenix area, there are ample opportunities to ride down a normal road and take a left and explore up in the woods uh, somewhere or the mountains or the desert and like neat, like two track areas. And there's so much exploring to do. And I've had, you know, tastes of it here and there in you know, a side by side or, you know, uh, with my friend, Derek, he had some press four by fours. We went off and did some four by four rides uh, or with Ron, I've gone out in his FJ a few times, or uh, with Josh and his Monteros. And any of the places that I've gone in those vehicles, like that whole trail that you and I did with uh, my brother-in-law, Andrew, in the uh, in the side-by-side, I could do on this bike. And yeah. that, to me, is what I want. I can go from 20 minutes from my house to Prescott, Arizona. So ride 20 minutes on pavement from my house be on dirt and be all the way in Prescott in the, you know, two or three hour ride. And that's what I'm into it for. That's what I want to do. So, and then it's plenty of power to ride around town and, you know, do the typical, you know, early Sunday morning coffee shop run, uh, which is what I did Sunday morning. I took it to, you know, four till four, they were having their air cooled Volkswagen day, which they do every, I think second Sunday. Um, So I went down there, Looked at some old Volkswagens and Porsches, um, four cylinder Porsches. Bradley, you missed out. And uh, yeah, I got, got a coffee, wandered around a little bit, and then got back on the bike and was home before it became 100 degrees. And it was a perfect start to my Sunday. And I was like, you know what? There's, this is living. This is life. There's a joke in the motorcycle community. I ride a, a BMW GS, is one of my yep. bikes. And Which is a weird, I cross shopped that. Because they're also cheap used, but they're yeah. higher mileage. Yeah, I mean, mine's got twenty thousand miles on it. It'll probably do another hundred and fifty before I need anything. One hundred percent. I just wanted a smaller bike to start with. But go on with your joke. For sure, I interrupted you. For sure, it's a it's a big bike. It's five hundred pounds. It's an eleven eleven hundred cc's. Like it's a big bike. Um, but the there are a lot of people who joke that the GS stands for get in Starbucks. Sure. Because that's what you ride it to do. It's like this monumentally uh, overbuilt off-road monster. And the vast majority of them just go to the coffee shop and back. Which is fine. Because that's what I'm going to do most of the time. And sometimes 
I'll take that amped up coffee energy and I'll go down a dirt road on the way home, maybe. Sure. But sure. Uh, spe- speaking of weight, that is one thing that I was nervous about about the Royal Enfield um, because they're not light bikes, which is part of the reason they're so slow. Um, I think the bike is like 427 pounds. That's not heavy. I mean, yeah, for it's, its not... size, it's not. It, yeah, it's for not 400 light, cc it's single, not... it's not light. Sure. Um, and the yeah. first time I sat on one, it was on the center stand. And I was like, man, this bike is way taller than I thought it was. But when you take it off at center stand, it becomes a totally manageable, normal, like actually mm-hmm. very low ride height bike. Like my, my yeah. legs, I'm flat foot on the ground with my, and my legs still have a little bend in them when I'm sitting on it. You know, I'm a fairly average be. height person. So it makes you very comfortable. So no, I'm, I'm loving it so far. Like I said, done about 70 miles. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately this weekend, I can't ride it because we're taking a camping trip to Big Lake. Um, and it's a four hours each way. I'm just not, I'm not comfortable in, in riding yet to go four hours my first weekend. Um, plus it's just me and Naomi going. So I'll ride in the car. We're riding the car together. Um, so I won't be able to ride this weekend, but I do only have one more week left of my job. And then I have a couple weeks off in between and I plan on taking some, uh, pretty long adventures on the bike on those two or three weeks I'll have to, to myself to kind of reset my brain in between careers here right so i'm super excited about it and i apologize for those listeners who aren't motorcycle people there'll be a few motorcycle centric project car updates coming up i think so all good goodbye good for you goodbye thank you oh goodbye is in good purchase gotcha i thought you were saying goodbye yeah 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 i'm (laughs) out (laughs) bradley out it's 11 o'clock here. Don't you know that? I have to go home. Oh, you're talking motorcycles? I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I only own two. I'm out. Three. But what's the third bike? Oh, the MB5. Yeah. My little so Honda. The GS, the electric. Yeah, the live, live wire. wire. And the MB5. And the MB5. Yeah. So that's a good collection of bikes. Yeah. I still need. I, I feel like I still need a. Um... Ducati Hyper Motard because I've wanted okay. one of those for so long. Sure. But but I'm done buying things for right now. Sure. Well, I learned after I bought this bike about a local group that does a vintage dual sport um, run every year. Mm. Uh, it's like a hundred mile dual sport run and they end in Williams, Arizona and do kind of like a whole celebration of the thing. And I may or may not have already started looking for a DT one. So <laughs> it's fine because sure. they're like, they're, they're like 800 bucks if you find them and they're cool. So DT one for anybody who doesn't know is like the first, uh, the first real Japanese kind of dual sporting motorcycle. It's a two stroke Yamaha kind of came out around the same time as the Honda CL 350, the Elsinore. But uh-huh. Anyway, Moving on. That's another one I'd love to add to my collection. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you had one and I had it for a while and neither one of us have it anymore. So there it is. But anyway. Anyway, Andrew, anything else to add to this podcast or you think that uh, we're going to end it there? I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we had plenty. Uh, it's a good episode link. I like it when we get to about an hour. So. Yeah, and we had some other stuff planned that we'll have to put off to another episode. So, Bradley, you're welcome we will. To come back. We'll save it for the next one. Yeah, Bradley, if you want to come back next week, you're welcome back. We want to talk of a uh, we have kind of a subject episode planned, right? Yeah. So it's been a while. Deep, deep yeah, dive I'm, episode. I'm happy to come back if you want me back. Yeah, we'd love to have a third party talk about the uh, this particular subject. Cool. So, yeah. Excellent. All right, Andrew. Uh, well, Bradley, where can they find you? Oh boy, I haven't done one of these in a long time. Uh, <laughs> you can find my postings. Um, I was banned from Twitter, so I'm not there anymore. Nobody is. Um, but I, <laughs> I'm uh, at plugin hybrid on hi Brad on Instagram. Plugin hi Brad. I am at. Um, I think I'm also at plugin hi Brad on Threads. Yep. And, uh, yeah, uh, Crawford Museum everywhere. 
Stripe Design everywhere. Uh, go check it out. Excellent. All right. How about uh, regular co-host Brad? <laughs> Where can they find you? Regular, regular old Brad uh, can be found on Instagram as always at uh, tsiss three five zero. Uh, and currently, that's pretty much it. Um, well, also on Instagram at Scale Autocast, and that's pretty much about it right now. All right. Well, you got out off topic on Instagram, uh, out off topic podcast on Facebook. Uh, I yeah, I did out off topic for us on Threads, so it's on there. I don't know what's going on. That's like it's weird to figure out. We'll get there, I guess. Maybe, maybe it'll fizzle out. Who knows? Um, I'm Ray Snager on Instagram and uh, also on Threads now and still on Twitter occasionally. <laughs> and then so. the important one, which if anybody makes it to this part of the plugs, is Discord. Join us on Discord. Yes. Where oh, yeah. You can find me on the Discord too. I do love the yeah. Discord. Yeah. 40, uh, if you want to join the Discord, well, how many? 43. 40? 43? Yeah. 43. Yeah. Maybe. Right. 10 or 20 of us that post pretty regularly i'd say there's about 20 regular users there's probably another 10 that pop in maybe once or twice a week and then there's yeah. some others that are there and they'll come in if you tag them <laughs> a lot of people have discord for other stuff other sure. groups so yep. that's kind of what it makes so that's kind of what i was thinking the other day right you're you're going away from bigger social media sites where it's like everyone yeah to just little gatherings like discord discord is like more like a forum yeah and then the same thing with car meets instead of these giant car meets you just do some with a you know a limited number of like-minded enthusiasts so it doesn't get too crazy yeah organized on the discord oh yeah yeah i mean i don't need to have like a thousand people on here i mean if if we had a thousand listeners sure that'd be great but (laughs) that might get a little chaotic so I think we have a thousand listeners, but we definitely have a thousand people on our Discord, and that's yeah. fine. But Brad has more a thousand cars, but yes, more, more, some, some, some more people is always welcome, and uh, the crowd there is pretty good. And it's a, uh, we have a pretty strict rule of uh, no politics and no anything controversial. And uh, the the few times that that rule has been broken, Andrew and I have deleted the, the post pretty quickly, and uh, just reminded the person who posted it, and uh, it's been pretty pretty good. So. It's, it's it's not that we're anti politics or anything. It's just that it's not it's not a space for that. There's it's plenty a, of places to do it. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a safe space for car talk and movie talk and other music talk, I guess. And uh, if you're in there long enough, the wrong word. You yeah. will get ripped on. So yeah, you yeah. will get ripped on, and you'll probably get memed. Uh, <laughs> there's some pretty good memes about Andrew and I on there that have been created that are pretty yeah. pretty funny. Make well, sure you use good. your good ratchets. Yeah. Yeah. Don't use a ba- don't don't use your cheap ratchets and take a picture. You will be lambasted. I learned. <laughs> so, although I also did learn that people were very supportive that I was at least doing projects. Yeah. So, just don't use your poor ratchets. And there's some good advice too on the project car updates. There is. There's also bad advice, so it's just like anywhere else. <laughs> also, one of the bonuses there is also pretty cool. Is that if you see a car that you want to buy somewhere and it's out of your range. Usually somebody on that discord is somewhere near it and can help you out. So that is true. Also, occasionally Andrew and I give away free cars. So <laughs> yeah. it's a good place to go. <laughs> so I feel like, um, if people have listened this long, we should throw them a little treat. And because, okay. because I found the best Craig, Craig, don't tell me ever. I have to do this, just one, and then we'll okay. end it. All right. That's fine. That's fine. And this would be a secret. This is like the after credits on a Marvel yes. movie right now. Yes. post credit scene. All right. All right. So. Which, hold on. Before we get there, can I rant real quick about that? Yes. Um, I hate that Marvel has done that. Yep. And makes me sit through every goddamn movie now. Because yep. I always expect there to be one. And when there's not, I'm actually happy that there's not. But I'm also mad that I'm still sitting in the theater. So I've found the answer to that. Walk out as soon as the movie's over. Because there is always the post credit scene on YouTube. Okay. Uh, good call. No matter yeah, I, what. 
I sat after Walk Indiana out. Jones. I sat after Indiana Jones, which was a it's great not a Marvel movie. <laughs> yeah, but still, no, but they're making every other movie do it. Every other movie's doing it now, so I figured that one would do it too. And they didn't do it, and I was like, "God damn it!" Also, thank you for not doing that. Yeah, you know what the what the first movie was to do that? I learned recently. No. Any guesses? Uh, well, it wasn't a Marvel movie. It sounds like. Nope. Um, I bet. Oh, it was oh, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nope. Ah. Is it really early? Give me a decade. Yeah. Seventies. Seventies. Yeah. Ah, uh, holy grail. Nope. Airplane. Huh. Oh. I can't even picture what the scene is. Because you probably didn't like think. I've never it, seen it. It's, appara- it's, it's apparently so. In the beginning of the movie, the guy gets left at the curb in the taxi cab. Yep. It flashes back to him at the very end of the movie. Huh. Mm. <laughs> All right. Post credits. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. You got your listening ears on? Rare. Rare. Blank, 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 blank. Five speed. $6,500. Blank, 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 blank. Five speed manual transmission. 116,540 original miles. Uh Car has been professionally painted. Polar white base coat. Clear coat, which is the original color. Runs and drives great. Tires look new, but are 20 years old, which is how long I have owned this car. New parts, timing chain, water pump, thermostat, timing belt. That doesn't make sense. Alternator (laughs) belt and air belts. Front and rear struts and strut bearings, tie rod ends, front and back brake shoes, and hardware. New rotors and front calipers. Gas tank, front wheel bearing, front end alignment, new windshield, and just replaced new fuel pump. The following parts, wear NOS, uh, tail lights, headlights, front and rear emblems, turn signal lenses, fog lamps, hood, and factory blank roof rack. Factory blank blank accessory floor mats has factory air that does not work. Rear brakes hang up from not driving it much. The blank has all of its original interior and purple gauges. Really rare factory aluminum rims and powder coated lug nuts. The blank oh. has a special VIN number and front blank bumper with working fog lights and a special rear glass with wing. Clean Ohio title in my name. Rear glass with wing. Huh. The only indicator of brand is polar white. Yep. I knew you would know Um, that. I know two brands that use polar white. One of them wouldn't be a car you would list here and also wouldn't have a lot of those features. And it's Hyundai. The other is Mercedes Benz. Mm. So my guess is that it's a Mercedes Benz, unless there's a third one I'm unaware of. Um, Porsche has a polar silver, but but polar white, not polar white. Uh, I mean, also, his he could be wrong. He could just call his car polar white because some people do that. It's entirely possible. It does say Weird. which is the original color. So yeah, it, but it also said timing belt. You said that doesn't make any yep. sense. Which well, also it said, could... it said ti- new parts, timing chain, water pump, thermostat, timing belt. Okay, so it's it says well, I don't it has which belt. one it is. Yeah, yeah, I don't know which one's correct. I'm gonna assume it's a timing chain. He said it first. Um, All right. Oh, uh, if, there are no uh, pictures of the engine, so I can't confirm. But Volkswagen has cars that have belts and chains. Oh, because they would have a belt for the cam. This it's a belt for the cam gears. Yeah, like the cam gear, but then inside the head, the twin cams are tied together with a chain. Oh, oh, oh! Sure, sure, sure. That's like a sixteen valve. Yeah, I suppose. I I don't think this is laid out like that, but it could be. I've never right. taken one apart. Is it one of these like SL 500s or something? It's not an no, SL. It's got, it's got a roof rack, so it's not a convertible. Oh. It has a roof rack and a wing. Or what did it say? Rear, rear, rear glass. Special with rear wing. glass with wing. All right. I'm going to put one out there. Five, did you say five speed? 
It is a five speed. Okay, this is a, and I don't know the W code, but it's the it's the tiny hatchback C class. Uh, CLK two thirty. CLK, yeah, CL two thirty. I think it's CL. Isn't it CLK? I think CLK is, is the hurt? convertible, and CL two thirty is the hatch. I I don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a Mercedes guy, so I'm digging deep here. But it sounds like I'm not right because you've already told me that it is not that. Right, no. All right. Uh... You were closer when you said Hyundai, but it is not a Hyundai. Huh. So it's Asian. Polar white. Well, the only things I can think of that have a wing on the glass are a 3000 GT Eagle Talon. Um, right, okay. The ZX. Before you get too hung up on that, I have never seen another one with this wing. So okay. if this is a factory <laughs> wing... If it's, it's not a 300 ZX. Wing, it's very, very rare. No, it's not a 300 ZX. And the, it says rare Roof aluminum, line. rare aluminum wheels, which means they don't yes. normally have aluminum wheels. It would normally have Roof steel track. wheels. Yes. So we're closer with Hyundai, but it's not a Hyundai. It's probably Asian then. Um, if I was closer with Hyundai. And I can't think of the brand with polar white though. That's really throwing me. I should probably get off that. What about what about purple gauges? Did that That's, give you? I anything? was thinking about that too, but it didn't give me anywhere. No, I don't know. You, uh, I'm thinking of weird gauges. I think of uh, late model Pontiac GTO or. Oh sure, yeah, those blue had blue gauges. gauges, or you could get them with blue gauges. Uh, the GTO you could get with they were color matched the interior, so you had a red interior, you get red gauges; blue interior, blue gauges. Uh, yellow car, you get yellow gauges. Silver car, silver gauges. Mm-hmm. You get a few different ones. Um, polar white. This is a good one because there's a good amount of info, but not enough info. Right, right. Is this a car sold in the United States? Is not some weird it, import? It was definitely sold in the United States. You have seen one before. It is not like... It's probably rare in like the the northeast and the Midwest because they would have all rotted away. Polar white's going to be the next uh, winter polar flavor. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, polar white is such a simple name. I'm sure there's other brands I just don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking from my body shop background, what car brands use polar. I will give you uh, I'll give you the stuff on the side. So condition excellent, cylinders four. Okay. Drive front wheel drive, fuel gas, size compact, type hatchback. Honda Civic. No, one point three liters. Woof. What the Christ is 1.3 liters? Was it a is it a Chevy Sprint Turbo or something? No. Closer. <sighs> Geo Metro. Similar. Suzuki Swift. Suzuki? No. And not Suzuki Swift. You were closer with Hyundai. So Hyundai is is on the right track. So it's something Kia? Kinda. Jesus Christ. Oh, Ford, Ford, um, Ford Festiva. Uh, Aspire. Aspire. As- uh, Ford yeah. Aspire. Yeah. Yep. The, also I'm going to send the you Kia, this. The Kia Pride. Yes, it was a Kia Pride. I'm going to send you this. It is the, the most cherry example I've ever seen. Okay. So it is wild. We're going a little long now. We had a plan to do this, which is why you had one pulled up. And it's funny because I had pulled up two cars. Um, don't give them away. Uh, I'll get different ones for next time because it, it's more funny to say it now. But one of them was a three-cylinder white Geo Metro. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Geo Metro convertible for 3600 Or in the oh. same town, there was a white Mazda Miata convertible for 3750 
And I was like, oh, this wow. would be a great like <laughs> comparison shopping. Which do you want? The yeah. low mile mint condition geometric convertible with 3600 or the automatic Miata, which is a bigger drawer at that point. But All right. Well, I, that was a good I, one. I stumped you. You, 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 you. Well, we got there eventually, but you had to sort give us way more clues. Yeah. So yeah. that was that was a good one. That's an obscure car nowadays. Whoa, this so. thing's cool. Right? It's really cool. I don't think I want to pay $6,500 for it. No. But it's cool. No. And I owned one. I had an Aspire. And I, I kind of miss it a little bit. I've never... I don't have any experience in an Aspire. But I do like a Fiesta. So... Weird. It's... It's not a good car, but it was fine. I'd call those gauges blue, but yeah. Yeah, well. Anyway. And I had I had no idea they had multicolored gauges. Interesting. Again, it was the one of those like, you know, interesting car, but is there any market for it? Right, right. 20-year-old tires, 120,000 miles. Six thousand five hundred dollars. Eh, yeah. Maybe not. So twenty year old tires. So I would drive it, and you guys would. They're fourteens or whatever. So yeah. go buy two hundred dollars worth of tires. Right. And say it has brand new tires. Right. Right. <laughs> That's true. Also true. Anyway, excellent. Well, that was a great episode, guys. All right. Now it's gone way too long, so we should shut it down. Yeah. All right. But uh, I do appreciate that. That was a uh, an excellent add to the. To the uh, to the show here, so well, good time. time. All right, well, as always, keep your cars analog and aim for the roses.